Well, good morning. good morning. If you have not seen that movie yet, I would encourage that. And I very rarely encourage movies. That's absolutely true for me. Um, you know, one of the things that it says there is Jesus stops the raging. But if you're not careful, uh, you can be a follower of Christ and actually become an angrier person. Um, if you remember what Jesus prayed, he, he, and he said that we should be known by our love. And yet, so many times, if we don't practice a heart of worship, if we don't practice a heart that finds joy in daily living, we will allow the world and the news and the friendships and the other stuff we see to pull us into an attitude of anger and frustration and irritation, and you'll start to drive like your pastor. I mean, it just goes downhill. So um, I will tell you the clip that I really wanted, and Kristen laughed last night because I said, did you know I looked at that many clips? She goes, oh yeah, I could hear you every time. So the clip I really wanted was from one of my favorite childhood me memories uh, and ma favorite movies. My dad did not take us to the movies often. And if he took us to the movies, it usually involved either Burt Reynolds or Clint Eastwood. And so, uh, and that guy from Magnum, whatever that guy's name was. No, not Selleck. What's the guy who was in the card movie and he was also a private investigator? James Garner. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so that's a, one of those three had to be in the movie usually if we went. So he took us to see this movie. I was about eight years old and it gave me a totally wrong view of driving. And just to give you a hint at what the movie was about, the theme song actually runs through my mind often when I'm driving, especially if I have a long way to go and a short time to get there. <laughs> and I changed the words to northbound, westbound, eastbound, and down. And so, um, so my brother and I, we went to that movie. And now if you watch the movie... And I will say, let me tell you why I was frustrated, because I said, that's the clip I want for church. I want to show how the movie said, when you're driving, it's going to be full of laughter and joy. And if, if you watch any clip, any part of that movie, it is, it is Burt Reynolds laughs the whole movie, <laughs> oh, the whole movie that, I can't do his laugh, but, but the whole movie he laughs and and fun things are happening in there. Hey, buddy, what you doing back there? Breaker one nine for the rubber ducky, you know, or whatever they were doing. We used to have this thing called a CB rate. Well, okay. So anyway, and did you? Did anybody in here actually ever listen to a CB rate? Just turned on. Yeah, we're weird. Okay. So anyway, so um, it's kind of like the internet in 1970, whatever. Anyway, so. Um, so you're watching this movie and everybody's just having a good time and the song comes on and he's running from the police. And so my brother and I had a very, growing up in Miami, we had a very wrong view of driving. And so um, what's interesting now is here's what I've noticed about driving, especially when I'm in a hurry. Um, I need a sticker on my car that says someone in this car probably needs to go to the bathroom. Because I cannot tell you the number of times driving home or driving somewhere that one of my children suddenly said, Dad, I have to go now. On I-4, I don't know what to do for you. And so, of course, then you're trying to hurry wherever you're going. And, of course, there's four people blocking all four lanes. And I watched Smokey and the Bandit. They helped each other. I mean, if the truckers saw the car coming by, they got out of the way or hit them from the police. I mean, there was a lot of... That does not happen. And the other thing I've noticed is I'm not laughing. I'm not enjoying myself. And, and so let me tell you about my driving and your life. If we're not careful, all of us are trying to get from one place to another and our focus is so much on trying to get from point A to point B that we not only ignore the people on the journey with us, but we might even be mean to them. We, we might even be angry. 
We might even be aggravated because as we're going through life, we think life's about getting from A to B. And so if somebody runs behind, if somebody slows us down, if somebody doesn't do what we want them to do when they want it to, do you know how many people ruin vacations because they're yelling at each other about hurry? You ever really thought about that? You're on vacation. The point is to enjoy each other. And here's the truth about life. As much as you can see that in a car, you're like, yeah, yeah, in a car, that makes sense. No, no. We do that if we're not careful every day. Because the truth is, all of our lives are full of speed bumps. You all have a speed bump. You have a surgery coming up. You, you have a difficulty coming up. You've got a physical problem, maybe an emotional problem, maybe a family issue. And you're looking at that while you're going through life. And you're already aggravated, frustrated, focused on that. And the people on this journey with you are not reaping joy from you. They're reaping frustration, irritation, aggravation. Why? Not because of what's going on right now, but because you're concerned, you're worried about... By the way, this... You're worried about what's next. And on the way home last night, I said to Kristen, this is just me practicing the sermon. And she said, you're not practicing the sermon. I said, the non-example of the sermon. By the way, it was really funny on the way home. She said to me, you got kind of preachy during that one part, but you're a preacher, so I guess that's okay. I'm like... I'm like, well, my mom didn't come to church last night, so somebody's got to make that comment on the way home. So let me ask you this question today, and we're gonna, this is what we're going to talk about. What is keeping you, ready, from joy? And what is keeping you from worship today? What's it that you're worried about or frustrated about or aggravated about or, or dealing with that's uncomfortable? By the way, there's always something uncomfortable. So what is it? And so I want you to, today as I'm talking about these things, I want you to think about that and I want you to constantly try to say, God, I want to give that to you so that I'm not so focused on that that I can't bless these people near me. A life of worship can be full of joy even in the busyness. So let's talk today about how to worship every day. Number one, prepare and praise while in progress. This is the most Baptist point I've ever made. Three piece. All, I could just, this could just be the sermon. So we should prepare for our day. We should say, God, thank you. By the way, just like I did with the kids, I think sometimes we just need to look at our hands and say, God, wow, God, you're so good. And I don't know about you, but I'm an idiot. And so I have done spray foam with no gloves. <laughs> Any of you ever try that one? Did you know you cannot get that off? But you know what's amazing? There's no spray foam on my hands. Because God created where all that stuff that I've done, the time I cut the end of this finger off, and it's back. The time that, the time that I got all kind of foam all over my fingers and clothes and everywhere else, in my hair, everywhere. And guess what? God created me so that even mistakes are healed. So listen to this. Here we go. Nehemiah, and we're going to pick up in chapter 7. We're going to kind of flop through three chapters today. Here we go. After the wall had been rebuilt, and I set the doors in place. Remember, they're rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, and Nehemiah's in charge of this. Third time they've tried, and Nehemiah's actually having some success. And it says, I put the doors in place. The gatekeepers, the musicians, and the Levites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hananiah, along, excuse me, Hanan. Oh, you say those two. How dare you have two names that are almost the same. My two H brothers. I'm doing my best up here. The commander of the citadel. Why? Because he was a man of integrity. That word integrity means trustworthy. By the way, if you're going to hire people for your business, if you're going to hire people to do something on your house, if you're, I, I know they can be wonderful, amazing at their work, but if they are not trustworthy, you just hired the wrong person. And so trustworthy, and so you can have the best musicians in the church, but if you don't hire somebody trustworthy, they're going to lead to issues in the church. And then it continues, and they feared God, he feared God 
more than most people do. And I love that. And this idea of the fear of God is the idea that you realize how awesome God is. Listen, if you want to be able to worship, if you want to be able to live a life of worship, one of the things you have to recognize is how awesome God is. So on those days when you're frustrated and irritated and dealing with something, stop what you're doing and realize how awesome. Some of you just need to take a walk and look around and say, God, I, that is just amazing. God, what you've created, what you've done, it's just amazing. And, and he, by the way, one of the things I know, you can sit in a hospital bed and look out the window and do this. So I know you can do it in a car. And I know you can do it in a cubicle. So we have to take time to do that. And then it continues. The gates of Jerusalem aren't to be open until the sun is hot. I love that. It's about safety, right? While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar, Katie, bar the door. Also, appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their post and some near their own houses. Now, listen to this. Now, the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it, and the houses had not been rebuilt. What are they telling us here? Nehemiah realized that safety and worship were more important, the most important things right now. And so even though there were speed bumps, we need to still get people here. We still need to rebuild the houses. Nehemiah knew it was time to worship. Listen, if you're not careful, you will go through life getting from one place to the other, looking at the next speed bump, looking at the next speed bump, looking at the next speed bump, and not taking time to love the people around you. And not taking time to love the God who created you. And here's what I know. If you, as you're heading to that next speed bump, if you will say, God, you know what's next. I trust you today. If you'll do that, then what will happen is, as you understand how much God loves you, it'll make you more loving or available to love the people near you. But if you go through life and whatever your speed bump is, whatever you're angry about, whatever you're frustrated about, if you focus on that, oh, I fear for the people that are near you. How many of you know an angry person? Don't look at them. Do not look. No. Right? We all do. We all know an angry person. And by the way, they probably don't know they're angry. And if they do, they blow it off. If you ask them about it, they're like, yeah, I struggle sometimes. I'm like, sometimes? Right? We all know that person. Why? Because they've lost sight of what really matters. I love this. James 5.13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. What does that mean? It means you're taking the speed bump, <laughs> whatever that is, and you're saying, God, help. And your focus is no longer on the speed bump. You can glance at the speed bump, but gaze on God. God, I'm going to gaze on you. I'm giving you this relative. I'm giving you this situation at work. I'm giving you this neighbor that I'm dealing with, this situation I'm dealing with, this difficulty in my life, this physical problem, mental problem, emotional problem, whatever it is. God, I'm giving it to you. So pray, and then it says this, if anyone's happy, if you're happy and you know it, Let them sing. And the word sing here is really cool. It literally means to pluck. So it's the idea of playing a guitar. I love that. I love that. If any of you is happy, let them play the guitar or the harp or the, I don't know, what else you pluck. Banjo. There you go. By the way, did you know I can play banjo? Poorly. But I can play it. Let me tell you about a story about a man named Jed. Now you got that song in my head. All right. Let them sing or play songs of praise. Listen to what John Ortberg said. And by the way, John Ortberg, one of my favorite, well, my favorite living Christian author. If you've never read anything by him, I encourage you. If you want to be encouraged, inspired, reminded of how awesome God is, read something by John Ortberg. I need to worship because without it, I lose a sense of wonder and gratitude and I plod through life with blinders on. If you've ever gotten in a fight on vacation, <clears throat> you missed the point of vacation. If you've ever gotten in a fight in a car because you were waiting on somebody to hurry up because you were going to go on a date with them, you have missed the point of dating. 
Our schedules are not to be worshipped. If we worship God, guess what? Sometimes we have to say, God, you know what? It's not going the way I want, but help me to love the people around you, even when I'm aggravated and irritated. And a non-example, like my wife said to me last night. Number three, number two, embrace Scripture. Embrace Scripture. Do you know what this is? I had to get one of these because I think that I can cut drywall with no help. And so let's say I had a piece of drywall that was four foot wide and eight feet long or six feet long or however long it is, and I wanted to cut it down the middle. It would be a perfect two foot to start because I used the measuring tape, and I thought I was cutting it even, and when I went to put it up, I realized that it was one foot at the other side. Because without a T-square, I could not cut evenly, and the T-square helped me to stay on track for where to run my razor blade and to keep it level. I will tell you that I have still on occasion thought, eh, I don't need to get that out. I got a good enough eye. I can cut that nice and straight. And I'm instantly reminded of why I need tools to keep things straight. And here's the truth about the Bible. You live in a world that continues to tell you what really matters. You live in a world that, that continues to say to our kids, hey, be famous. Material things will make you happy. There is no God. You're just a blob of cells. And so let me just read a couple of things about kids right now. And, I, and this really got to my heart this week and made me concerned about kids. It's the reason I had the kids talk I had this morning, letting them know that they're loved. And if they forget that anybody likes them, remember the pastor likes them and they can call the pastor. Because here's the deal. One in five uh, adolescents last year suffered from a major depressive episode in the previous year. That means if you're looking at 10 kids, two of those kids had a major depressive ad, uh, episode. Feelings of persistent sadness and hopelessness grew by 40% between 2009 and 19. And so in those 10 years, hopelessness for our kids. Instagram, harmful to teens, making girls in particular feel worse about their body image and leading to thoughts of suicide. So here's what, the, here's, here's what they've discovered. They've discovered that physical health, people are actually, kids are actually physically healthier, but mentally less healthy. Why? Because there's no absolute truth. You're just a bunch of cells. You came out of nowhere. There's nobody that cares about you. Being famous is the most important goal. You can fill your heart with material things. So let me tell you some things the Bible says to give you that reminder and to remind your kids and to remind your grandkids and remind your neighbor kids of these things. If you get a chance, say one of these things to them. God created you. God loves you. One of the things we need to remember that sounds really harsh is we're sinners saved by grace. Why is that important? Because kids... Even if you tell them people are naturally good, they're like, well, they don't know me. Because they're just like us. Everyone is broken. Everyone is messed up. C.S. Lewis said the best part of life is when you look at somebody next to you and you go, you too? Everybody in this room is messed up somewhere. If you get to know them enough, you'll figure it out. If you listen to me on a Sunday, at some point during the sermon, you're going to go, there it is. <laughs> there it is, yeah, there it is. I always joke that people join my small group and they're like, oh, he's such a good Christian. And then three weeks later, they're like, who made him the head of this church? <laughs> the Bible says the only way that you can fill your heart is with God's love. Walking with Jesus is the most important goal, not being famous. That'll never fulfill you. That's why we, one of the things I love is that we say we're the perfect church for imperfect people. But we're not in perfect church for imperfect people so that people celebrate their imperfection. It's so that we say, God's working on me. I'm, I'm saying, God, would you fix that dumb part in me that gets mad every time somebody pulls out in front of me? They run the stop sign and then go 30 miles an hour. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? And God's like, that's Gabriel. You have no idea. I'm sending angels to do that now. I, okay, we got work. I mean... I still think God had five lights put in here just to slow me down. You know, there were only, there's only one light originally on the way to this church building. God's like, we got to put some more lights in. That guy needs some patience. <laughs> Sorry, that has nothing to do with the sermon. <laughs> Nehemiah 8, if you think the Bible's not important, listen to this. 
Ezra opened the book. You might have heard of that guy. He's got some book named after him. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. <laughs> it's good because I'm three feet tall. So. And he opened it. The people all stood up. Now Ezra's like, dang it. All right. So Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, amen, amen. Which amen just means that's right. That's true. Or so be it. And um, I've been in prayer times with people. Um, I remember praying with people, Peter Lord early on Sunday mornings. And we'd be in a prayer group. And there was one of the guys there that would go, yep. Yep. So for some of you, maybe that's the way you should say it. Like at the end of a prayer, everybody's like, amen. And you're like, yep. And that's what it means. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord God with their faces to the ground. They read from the book of the law of God. Now listen to this. This is what I feel like my job as a pastor is. Making it clear and giving the meaning. Why? So the people understood what was being read. In order for you to grow in your understanding of Scripture, you have to spend more time in the Bible. You can't just show up Sunday and know God's Word by heart. You've got to spend time. It's like eating. You can't just eat one meal a week. Most of you don't struggle with that. Right? Right? You struggle with the opposite of that, right? And so we, when you're reading the Bible, one of the things you have to recognize is, hey, it's like math. You know how I know about math? I'm going to confess my sins to you right now. I got almost all A's in my master's degree and my doctorate degree. But when I first started college in Miami, I took an algebra class and I thought, eh, you don't have to do the homework? Good. I'll just take the tests. You know what I found out very quickly as I studied for the test at the last minute? I didn't do any of the homework. I failed a class my first year of college. My dad made me pay for it. That's why I remember so well. <laughs> Thankfully, it was only 150 bucks back then. Back in the old days. Oh, never mind. Okay. So, so I failed the class. Why? Because I never spent time in the book. Listen, if you want to let God's spirit be in you during the day, spend some time in God's word. Take a verse and just... Begin to meditate on it. Take, go to the book of John if you've never read the Bible and read one story and say, God, would you allow that to sink in to my heart? Listen to what it says in 2 Thessalonians. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm, hold fast to the teaching we pass to you, whether by word, and that's the word for logos, living word, of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement. Boy, would that make your driving different? And good hope encourage your heart and strengthen you in every good deed and word. And basically, may God's love so fill you up that the things that you do and the things that you say would flow out of that encouragement. How would your week look different? How would your car ride look different? How would dealing with that difficult person look different? How would facing that situation look different if you allowed his eternal encouragement to strengthen you? Number three, confess and surrender. This week, Kristen and I watched a movie called Still with Michael J. Fox. And it kind of goes through his life. And most of us know who Michael J. Fox is. Back to the future. And so they, they know who that is. And so um, Michael J. Fox, if you didn't know, got Parkinson's disease. And he kept it secret for a long time. The best he could. Even when he was on family ties, he would put his hand in his pocket so that people couldn't see his handshake. And finally, he decided, you know what? You're only as sick as your secrets. And he let everyone know that he had Parkinson's disease. And at first he regretted it, but then he realized, I can't deal with it if I don't admit it. The truth about life is there are times that we have to confess to someone. We have to allow people to know the truth about us. We have to surrender to it or we never really deal with what God wants us to deal with. As they say in AA, you're only as sick as your secrets. So you need somebody who you can say, I'm struggling. They stood where they were and they read the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and then spent a quarter in confession. Why? Because as they looked at what God said, they said, well, I'm not lined up with that. And they confessed, I'm messed up. I'm broken. I need God's help. But in your great mercy, you did not put an end to them or abandon them. Why? Because you're a great and merciful God. Now, therefore, God, the great God, mighty and awesome, who keeps his covenant of love, do not let this hardship seem trifling in your eyes. 
the hardship that has come on us, our kings, our leaders, our priests, our prophets, our ancestors, and all your people from the days of the kings to Assyria until today, it has all happened to us. But you have remained righteous. And this is a, so, such an honest sentence. While we acted wickedly. If you really want to understand confession, when you stand in the presence of God, understanding, God, you do everything good. You do everything right. You respond properly, and I respond in anger and pettiness and self-centeredness and selfishness and pride. God, forgive me for me. And God, thank you that even in that, you choose to forgive you choose to love. You choose to care. Do you see how when you understand that, it helps you to understand that no matter how messed up you are, that God still absolutely loves you? That's what our kids need today, and that's what so many of our adults need today. Not only are kids struggling with mental health, adults are. Because we're holding up this, this what we say perfection is, and it has nothing to do with what God's called us to do. James 5.16 says it this way. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Why? So you may be healed. And that word healed is whole. There's something missing. Sometimes just saying to somebody, I'm struggling in this area. Could you pray for me? Somebody actually sent me a note. I got it this morning. It said, we're struggling. And I sent him a note back. I'm praying for you. We're here for you. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And let me tell you what that word righteous means so that you don't think it's just some holy person who sits in a cave. We have righteousness not because of anything we've done, but when we trust Christ. So that means if you have a Christian friend or a Christian neighbor or a Christian brother or sister, and you know all their faults because you've known them more than five minutes, if they love Jesus and they've surrendered to him, they have his righteousness. So their prayers, listen, their prayers are powerful and effective. And whether you think it or not, if you love Jesus, your prayers are powerful and effective. So I want to encourage you today. Can you walk with joy? Can you walk in an attitude of worship? The key is not to wait, not to say when I get to a certain point. It's just to say every day, God, you know what my burden is, my challenge is, my struggle is, my sin is. I surrender that to you now, Lord, would you fill me with your love? Lord, would you help me love these people near me? By the way, the love God part's easy, and then it says love others, and you're like, yeah, but I don't like them. <laughs> I don't know about you. I don't always like me. Do you? You ever look in the mirror, and you're like, ah. Guess what? God loves you anyway. And when you start to recognize, you know what, God, thank you that you love me anyway. Thank you that you love who I am. And God, that person that I don't like, you love them too. Oh, could you love them less than me at least? Can I be the favorite? By the way, God's like my mom. He tells everybody they're his favorite. My mom tells every, all the kids, you're my favorite. I overheard her tell my sister that one day. I said, what? She said, I tell you all that. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I pray this week that you just a little more will have a little more joy as you surrender to God in an attitude of worship. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian, to surrender to Jesus, to say, Jesus, I'm tired of walking in my own strength and walking my own way. I surrender my life to you. I know that Jesus died and rose again because I'm a sinner. I'm messed up. I'm broken. And when you surrender your life to him and your will to him, the Bible says he takes your sin and gives you his righteousness. God, would you change me? Maybe you're here this morning as I talked a little bit, God pointed out some things in your life that you need to confess. Hey, that's okay. If we confess our sins, the Bible says he is faithful and will forgive us. So he forgives. Ask him to help you to walk forward. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. I thank you for verses like we looked at today from thousands of or hundreds and even thousands of years ago, Lord, I thank you that even in those things, we see your truth. 
So Lord, would you remind us of the truth that's found in your word? Would you change us? Lord, for that one this morning who's discouraged, who's going against huge obstacles, may they know your love and grace today. Lord, thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.